PG Department of Computer Science in collaboration with Ideal Hands-On Private Limited USA. I invite everyone for this Friday International FDP on Innovative Strategies in Emerging Technologies. I hope day one session is very much useful for you. In continuation with the previous day, I invite everyone to join with Mr. Kaleen, who is going to enrich our knowledge on mobile app development in current markets. On behalf of Rajapalim Rajas College and all the faculty members and the organizing committees, I welcome everyone. Education is not the learning of facts, but the training of minds to think. I hope the session will unlock the golden door of freedom. Let me invite Mr. Ganesh Kumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Computer Science, Rajapalim Rajas College, to give the welcome address. I am very pleased to be here for day two faculty development. It is a moment of great privilege and honor for me to extend a hearty welcome to our resource person, Mr. Kali Kumar, and the other dignitaries, faculty members of post college and outside participants. As there is a saying, the rich and interactive experience have come to accept 
on mobile. Opt how create a new standards and acceptations for all digital media, including the web. The result is websites are evolving to become more app like in the rich functionality. With no further delay, I welcome you all for this program. Welcome you, sir. Thank you, Ganesh Kuna, sir. Now no. I call upon Ms. D. Saranya, Assistant Professor, Department of Computer Science, or RRC, to give Chief Guest introduction. Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to all of you for the A2 program. I feel extremely honored to introduce the Chief Guest today, Mr. Ali Mohammed, who acted as mobile technical architect in Ref Technology, San Francisco, USA. Every person has a small talent, qualities, and interests. It is just that you need to choose the area of your interest and not what others compel you to do. This is what Mr. Kaleem did. He has an experience over 15 years of launching products from conceptions to launch, business requirements, planning, design, development, and launch. Spearheaded teams in product management, product development, sustaining, support, and to deliver product services which are running on tens of millions of mobile devices around the globe. He worked in different process delivery models, agile waterfall. We are very grateful for you for accepting our invitation and making this happen. I now welcome Mr. Krishna Kumar Narayanan to give keynote address. Thank you, Sarnia Madam, and thank you, Nazreen Madam, and Ganesh Kumar, sir. Uh, thank you once again for inviting uh, IGL hands on uh, to this um, international faculty development program. And um, um, so, uh, basically, uh, yeah, thank you. I think there was a lot of background noise. Uh, thank you for inviting us uh, for the second day of um, uh, FDP program. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Kaleem uh, Mohamed, uh, one of our uh, key members of IGL hands-on team. Uh, I've known uh, Kaleem for the last uh, 10 plus years. Uh, we have been great friends, uh, great colleagues. Uh, he's a great engineer, uh, lots of experience in, in application development, mobile development, architecting solutions in a number of fields. And the last two years, um, Kaleem has been helping on the IGL hands-on front. Uh, and many students have benefited from his uh, classes and app development, cloud programming, uh, both in US as well as in India. Uh, so I'm really pleased to have uh, Kaleem uh, sharing his knowledge and experience to a larger audience uh, in, in India. Um, so thanks, uh, Kaleem, for uh, for accepting this offer and, and, and presenting your, uh, your topic. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, so back to you, uh, Sharanya, madam. So if, uh, if you are OK, then Kaleem uh, can start his presentation. Thank you, sir. I invite Mr. Kali Mohammed to take over the session. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you all. So okay, let me share my screen. Let me know once you started seeing the screen. Okay, so before it comes, I think, yeah, my name is Kaleem Mohammed. I am a, a technical architect, mobile side in Reef Technology. Then I have, uh, I think, yeah, so more than uh, 18 years of experience inside that, like uh, eight, 15 years, pretty much I spent on uh, uh, developing the uh, mobile uh, front, like uh, from the app level to the low level side. So uh, I think the, the mobile applications and then mobile is uh, always growing. There is no end uh, to that one. So because there are, uh, it's became a part of our uh, regular life, the mobile is, right? So I think pretty much in this room or uh, without the mobile phone, I don't think so. <laughs> Nobody is going to be here. So uh, if anyone doesn't have it, I think, yeah. So they will soon, they are going to get the, the mobile phones soon, right? If it is... Uh, here my daughter is 13 years she uh, with most of the time she's spending on the the mobile only so you can do anything with the mobile so i think uh, let's go and talk about uh, 
little bit about the mobile application development. So these are the topics I'm going to cover in this presentation today is uh, fixed statistics. And then I'm going to talk about some mobile application development. And then uh, some of the mobile application frameworks uh, currently available. And then uh, what are the integrated development environment we are going to use for developing the mobile application and then mobile application platform. And then once you develop the application, how you are going to push to the app to the stores. And then what is in 2020, the uh, mobile application development trends is going to be. Uh, it's a huge presentation. I think I'll take a Q&A's uh, end of this session. Fixed statistics is uh, 2.7 billion smartphone users across the world right now. I think uh, this is the, some some of the websites is mentioning that. And then 1.35 billion tablet users is worldwide. Average Americans checks their phone every 12 minutes. So I woke up in the morning. The first thing which I'm going to do is like, where is my mobile phone? Without that, it's like I'm so tense. Like, OK, because every contact, like all the contacts, and everything will be in my phone only. So, and then I immediately go, I check my WhatsApp and then interact with my friends. And then uh, if I want to order a food, I can just go and order the food by using the Uber Eats or DoorDash, Jomato, or if I want to book a, a cab or a taxi, I can just go and book it from my mobile. And then if I want to buy a ticket, movie tickets or the flight tickets and everything is happening in your uh, finger taps. There are tons of beautiful applications. So 10% of people check their phone every four minutes. Uh, uh, you use a smartphone at work, at home, and the street while we are eating in bed and even in cars. So I think nowadays, I think even if you are not inside the office, you can still take the office call on your mobile phone. There are very good applications are available. So, and then most of the people, do you know what they are going to do uh, on their phone? 90% of users are spending on the apps only so they can go and check uh, various things on the phone so how do you succeed in this space once you develop the app how it is going to be user needs to download their app and then user needs to start using your app so that that is the main two things uh, which needs to be so when you are up developing some application which needs to be useful for the user so think about in that way when you start developing the mobile application, like, OK, what exactly my application is going to give to the user and how they are going to use my application. This is the quick statistics. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about the mobile application developments. You can develop mobile application in three ways. So one is the web app development. The next one is the native app development. And third one is the hybrid app development. So uh, I'm going to talk uh, in detail about these three mobile application developments. The first one is the web app development. So web app development is maybe you can think about like uh, there is a website, right? So every uh, thing, every uh, organizations, they have their own websites. Is it going to be the same? It's not 100%. So because uh, in your regular website, you have a, a tons of content, right? It's a pretty huge content you have in it. So you cannot show everything on the mobile, uh, app, like a web app. So you need to condense that. And then you have to improve the functionality, which is you can show it to the user, which is useful for him. And this uh, mobile uh, web app development is basically you need a browser on your phone like a Safari and iOS device, and Google Chrome on your uh, uh, Android devices, or you can use some other, you can install some other browsers also on your phone because all the browsers right now is supported on the phones. So you don't need to download any apps. You can directly go to the browser, type your URL, and then you can start seeing uh, the content, which is, is for the, the mobile app. If you want to deliver mobile friendly content to a wide range of users, it doesn't involve any like hardware access, it doesn't involve anything, then you can go with uh, 
the web app development because yeah you don't need anything so you can just host a website and tell that okay uh, my user agent is going to be for the iphone and the android and then you uh, then the the web app they open on the browser on your mobile phone the smartphone they can see the content whatever you want to uh, show it to them but it definitely requires a network availability because it's not there is no app available on your smartphone it should require a network so you are going to uh, access the wi-fi or the lte connectivity and then you can go and then these uh, websites are hosted on some other uh, outside uh, third party uh, the web hosting services and then you can develop this web app using the javascript or html file you don't need any a software development kit so if you are a web developer you can easily write a, a web app for the mobile also what is the advantages of web apps it's easy to maintain it built for all platforms because nowadays there is an android there is an iphone and then the windows uh, smartphones so you don't need to write separately the apps for these phones you can just write it uh, a one website and then and then you just need to mention that which browser you are going to use it in that so that uh, when, whenever the user is opens on that particular browser it will uh, behave based on that one it's less expensive you don't need to have a, 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 a too many resources there is with one resource also you can achieve this functionality and then you does not require any app approval so you don't need to take any permissions from the apple or you don't need to take any permission from the google you just develop it host it and then people can access so if you want to update your website you don't need to go through any uh, a review process with the uh, google and apple you can just go and update your website and it will be uh, immediately it will go in effect so what are the disadvantages of web app is so mobile web apps have only limited scope as far as accessing a device internal features like if the iphone support uh, a lot of features and the android also support a lot of features but i think you cannot access all those functionality with the web apps web app is uh, just content uh, provider it's like you can provide the content to the users but you cannot access any hardware related stuff you cannot do any like uh, any uh, anything which is uh, uh, the device uh, hardware if you want to access you cannot do it with that so it is very hard to find in the uh, the web app until unless you don't uh, send an url to your friend or you don't uh, expose that url you cannot find uh, these your web uh, web apps in the apple store or the google play store so you have to uh, tell them the url and then they have to go and uh, type it into the browser so performance wise web apps are slower much less responsive than the native apps because it completely depends on the internet connection right so if your internet connection is not that great your web app uh, like you cannot like sometimes it takes long time to load your page it give a, like a frustration to the user so i think yeah that's the one of the the pain point with the web apps but i think yeah so other other than that i think if you are just want to give a some content to the user i think this is the the best next thing is the native app development this is the most of the apps if you see on the phones most of the people uh, they want to achieve the some hardware uh, access and the good performance and most of them are going to choose this path this is uh, a uh, built for a specific platform for example if you are developing an application for the iphone iphone and then you have to use their sdk you have to use their programming language you have to use their ide to develop the uh, the app whereas if you want to develop an application for the android you have to use their sdk so it's completely like a, a, a platform specific uh, uh, the development so if you are using if you are developing for ios the latest programming language is uh, is a sip and then they have a various version the the current version is like a 5.0 but before shift i think uh, you they we used to develop an app using the objective c 
uh, but I think you can mix match. Uh, you can use the Objective C if uh, some of the features doesn't support in the SIFT. You can just use the Objective C. It, it still works. Same thing with the uh, Android. Uh, you use the Java. We're using the Android uh, SDK, and then but officially now uh, Android like uh, Google is saying that there is a, 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 a Android specific programming language is a Kotlin is the officially Android development language you have to use. They have a special uh, integration development environment uh, for the selected operating system, like Android has Android Studio, whereas the iOS, like iPhone development, you have, you have to use the Xcode. So uh, you get uh, pretty much all the uh, emulators because there are uh, various kind of uh, devices available outside so how you are going to test it right so the android studio is a very good integrated development environment you can uh, use that and then you can go and check in the simulator how your application is performing and before you push it into the store so and from the apple they will provide the ios sdk every year there is an update from them the current ios sdk is like a 14.0 and then Google uh, provides their Android SDK. So now I think yeah, Android 10 is the latest, but I think they are working on the Android 11. Every time there is an SDK, it's all free. So you can just download and you can start uh, writing an application. So advantage of native apps is the best performance, right? Because you are directly uh, invoking the uh, the uh, APIs, which is comes from the the actual operating system developers, right? Like uh, the Apple and Google is giving an SDK. You can directly call, so you get the best performance. So complete su support from App Store and Play Store. So if you develop an app using the native apps, so uh, it will be like a, a complete support. You can get it when you want to push it uh, your app into the stores. And then developer access the full feature set of selected OS. Like uh, if anything, iOS like a, uh, Apple release, right? You can immediately get an access of that. So you can go using their beta SDK, start playing with that uh, a functionality recently, like AR Kit 3, Augmented Reality Kit 3, they released it. And then they release another one is App Clips. So you can immediately uh, take that and then start developing the application because it's uh, available right away. And then the approval process. Like if you want to push it into the App Store and Play Store, there is an approval process, which will give you a guarantee that there is no security loopholes in your app, and then it is compatible with their uh, SDK. So, so in the web apps, you don't have that security verification because there is nobody is approving your app. Uh, you just host it somewhere, and then uh, and people are accessing it, and then anyone can come and then uh, uh, hijack your uh, website. But here. They will uh, verify. Uh, they have a process. Uh, the app, Apple it has a very uh, tough process. It's not so easy to push it. But I think yeah, uh, you need to go through. Once your app is approved from the Apple, and then uh, it's like, uh, yeah, it's a security uh, guarantee that, and then your compatibility is also guarantee that you implement it based on their rules and regulation. And these apps, you have to install on the device. It will be you will have an offline support also. Even if you don't have an internet connection, you can still use these native apps, and then you can still uh, it will still work. So disadvantage of native apps is you require an experience in iOS and Android application programming language and its SDK. So yeah, you have to be uh, familiar with the uh, iOS SDK and then Android SDK and their languages, whatever it supports, like uh, Java or the Kotlin for the Android, and then Swift or the Objective-C for the uh, the iOS. So you need a required Apple developer account and Google developer account, uh, which is not uh, free. Uh, Apple developer account for individual is like a $99. Whereas uh, Google is uh, is not that uh, expensive. It's maybe it's uh, ten twenty dollars only. So if you want to write a simple application, native app is not a recommended one. 
if you definitely have an, any hardware interactions or anything you want to do it, then definitely go with the native app because you get a, a performance, better performance. Getting approval from the App Store, like an iPhone, is not that easy. It is, uh, you have to follow all the rules. There is a, a five, six pages of uh, their, uh, the whole rules you need to follow. So it can be more expensive to create and maintain these apps. Like uh, you have to have some uh, developer account. But you can develop the application. But when you are going to pay uh, the, the money, is like you want to push it into the store only. But yeah, you can do internal releases and all of them. Yeah, but it doesn't cost anything. The next one is the hybrid app. I think most of the companies are also going into this approach. So hybrid app works across multiple platform. It behaves like a native apps. It is a combination of native app and the web app. So uh, the hybrid apps is still use some native functionality and then you can develop a web app and then you can still access some native functionality in this one. You have to install these apps also on a device. It's not like a web development app, like you, you have to install this one. And apps are building using the HTML, uh, C hash, JavaScript, and dot programming languages. So if you build like a built an app with the faster speed and less resource, so you can write a code only one time and then it will work on all the platform. That's the beauty of this hybrid app development. Like you don't need to uh, write it for Android separately and iOS separately. You can just uh, write it in one language and then uh, using their framework and then it will work. So variety of mobile app development frameworks is available in this one. Uh, you listed uh, some of them here, but there are more, but I, I just uh, given here is only the, uh, the, the best ones, uh, the hybrid application development framework. Ionic is the one. It's an open source HTML5 development framework. So you can use this uh, framework to develop the hybrid app, which will give you a web app along with the native functionality. Phone Gap, this is from the Adobe, is a cross platform mobile app development framework. You can develop the hybrid app using this framework also. And Xamarin, a code of delight, this is from Microsoft. And then you use the she has to develop. Uh, this is a programming language they use here is the she has. And then um, uh, this is, yeah, with this one, you can develop a, 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 a you write a code uh, one time. It will work on the Android device. It will also work on the iOS. And then it will also work on the Windows 10 devices, the smartphone devices. The next one is the React Native. Uh, this is from the Facebook uh, open source. It actually, Facebook started uh, this one first, and then later they realized that, okay, this they can open source it. They open source this one. And then um, you can use this React Native uh, developing the app, uh, application for the iOS and Android. Uh, you just write it, and then it uses the JavaScript. So you write an app using the React Native framework, and then it will work on both iOS and Android. The new one is the Flutter. Uh, this is from Google. So now it is getting more attention and uh, a lot of people start using it. And uh, the programming language they use is the Dart programming language, which is as a bit new. Uh, the community also growing. So there are a lot of uh, people, uh, they started uh, using this one and then they started uh, responding. So they have a big community. But the React Native is that has a huge community so 2018 and 2019, most of the companies used the React Native, but now most of the companies are switching into the Flutter because you don't see a, a difference. Like a, if somebody writing a native application, how it looks like with the Flutter also, you will have the same kind of experience with the graphics and all of them. So uh, they are using the Flutter. So advantage of hybrid app development, Hybrid app does not need a web browser like web apps, right? So web apps is basically you need a web browser, but in hybrid app, it's the native plus web app, but I think, yeah, you don't need a web browser. So you will install the app on the device. 
uh, and then uh, you can like uh, this looks like an, a native app only so you install it the app will be there and then but i think the the frame you develop only one time uh, uh, and that's it so you write a code for only one time and then it will work for all the platforms so hybrid app have access to device internal apis and device hardware so uh, you can uh, access uh, pretty much all the hardware's uh, uh, like internal APIs, which is available in the SDKs, and then the device hardware in this hybrid app. But there is a uh, but you have to depend on some uh, on the plugins. Uh, you have to depend on third-party libraries to do that. So uh, if Apple release something, if I Android release something, you don't right away get it like a, a native app. That functionality somebody has to write a, a third party library uh, to that new functionality and then you can go and integrate into your uh, the hybrid app so which is like a, there is a, a delay is going to be there uh, right away that functionality is not available so it will have only one code base uh, needed for the hybrid so if one resource who is familiar with javascript and he is uh, very good in the react native he can write an application that will work for your Android and that will work for your iOS. You don't need to write it as separate. So that's the main advantage of going with the hybrid approach. And what are the disadvantages of hybrid apps? Hybrid apps are much slower than native apps. Definitely, if you're writing an application using their uh, native uh, APIs, that is much faster than this one because you are depending on some third party libraries. Those uh, needs to be like, uh, they have to do a a performance check with your libraries like how they are doing it right so so compared to native apps hybrid apps not that great so it's slower with the hybrid app development depends on third party platform to deploy the app wrappers so any new file like ARK is there if you want to bring it into the hybrid app somebody needs to go and uh, uh, make a javascript library which is internally calling this uh, ARK native apis and then giving to the access if you want to do a more customization, it will cost more money. So because uh, somebody, uh, you still need a, a native app development experience to access some of the new functionality, which means that you have to build a library, JavaScript library, and then use it in the hybrid app. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this application frameworks. Uh, I'm talking uh, the top two which is the react native and the flutter because these are the two is most of the people are using it now uh, if you are going with the hybrid app approach this is the two uh, people are using all the developers are using it so so react native is started by facebook and opus open source in 2015 you can just go and uh, download it and then you can start uh, developing the application so app developer build cross-platform apps faster by using a single programming language. If you are familiar with the JavaScript, you can develop a mobile application uh, for the iOS and Android. So React Native is already a mature tool, has a huge community. As I mentioned earlier, it's uh, 2018, 2019, uh, most of the, the app development happened in the React Native. So if anyone sees the, any issue, they solve it, there is a community is there, you can definitely go and find the solution. Like if you are running into some issue, there are a lot of community, a uh, lot of meetups happen, and then you can find the, rest, like, uh, the answers from the various experts. So React Native uses the JavaScript to build the cross-platform apps. And then the, uh, it uses the Facebook Flux architecture I gave a reference how the Flux architecture works, uh, I think in the end of the presentation. You can just uh, go and look into that one. And then the React Native framework can be installed using the Node Package Manager. So you just go, if you are a, 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 have an NPM, uh, you can just go and install the uh, native framework. So core React Native framework provides just the UI rendering and device access API. So once you download the SDK, you just get the UI rendering and device access API only. If you need anything, you have to completely depend on the third party libraries. So you React Native is too much depends on the third party libraries. 
any text editor there is no separate integrated development environment uh, is required for this one uh, for the native apps you have to still use the xcode or the android studio only but uh, for this hybrid application you don't need to uh, uh, use anything if you can just use the text editor or uh, nowadays i think most of them are using the microsoft visual code so you can use that one and then uh, uh, build the application there is no ide yeah it's a mandatory for this one as it is a javascript framework and there are a few unit level testing frameworks are available in javascript and you can use to test your uh, the the modules which you wrote and then you can do it but there is no ui level testing available for the react native if you want to test your application there is no uh, ui uh, automation testing available so you have to pay there are i think the uh, uh, the commercial ones are available i think you need to pay for that but there is no free the next one is the flutter this is the project started by google so they are uh, they started promoting this in the the uh, their io 2017 so app developers build cross platform app like in a react native faster by using a single programming language uh, like react native they use the javascript but in the flutter they use the dot programming language which was introduced in, by google in 2011 and uh, rarely used by developers so this is like if you want to use the flutter i think yeah you need to learn but i think if you know the javascript uh, pretty much all the syntax are the same so it's easy to learn uh, so flutter uses the dot framework which has most of the components inbuilt when you see the react native only the ui rendering and the uh, native level api only you have it in the sdk and then you are depending on the third party libraries to do but in the flutter pretty much all the functionality is inbuilt all the uh, all the uh, the libraries are inbuilt so they use a skia c++ engine which has all the protocol composition and channels like uh, react uh, native uses the flux here they use the skia So how do you download this one? There is a binary. Uh, it's not like an NPM package, which you do in the React here. You just go and download the complete the zip file, and then everything is included in there. So they have a very good documentation. I added the details in the reference. Uh, Flutter is, a, as I mentioned, is a rich in development APIs and UI components, while React Native is too much dependent on the third party libraries, right? And then the app, if you develop in the Flutter, it looks exactly like a, a native uh, app experience the user will get it. And but the programming language dot is not common programming language. The support is very minimal because it's a new programming language. Uh, you may not find a, a, a big, huge uh, community like uh, React Native JavaScript. Uh, it's people are learning it. I think yeah. So you may not find it, but you need to. Uh, go and read the documentation and start using it. But I think, yeah, in uh, now a lot of uh, developers are uh, started using the Flutter. I think the next year, maybe you may have a huge uh, support also. So as I mentioned, like, yeah, you need uh, to put some extra effort to uh, uh, to develop the application. As I mentioned, Flutter community is growing, uh, but there are not enough resources to solve the developer common issues. So you have to put the next effort. So Flutter also has a rich set of testing features, uh, uh, as like uh, you can do a unit testing, uh, you can do a UI automation with the Flutter. So the next topic is the integrated development environment, which I talked. So if you want to develop the app as a, uh, for the native application development, there are two uh, uh, development environments available. For Android is Android Studio. The latest version you can see now is a 4.0.1. This is used for the Android native app development. Uh, it comes with the SDK. It comes with the uh, all the emulators. Uh, you can uh, create a Android 7 phone or Android 8 phone or Samsung phone. You can just create it. You can test your application without pushing to the App Store, without having a, a regular real device. So all the emulators are available. Same thing with the iOS. They have a 
official integrated development environment is the Xcode. Uh, version is uh, 12, latest version. Uh, recently, they think yeah, uh, they released it. That one is still in the beta. Uh, this you can use for iOS native app development. It comes with the SDK, all the iOS SDK. It comes. Uh, you can write a, 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 a smartphone application, or you can. Uh, I, they have a TV OS. They have a uh, the watch OS, and all of them you can write it using this uh, integrated development environment. And it also comes with the simulator. Uh, you don't need a real uh, iPhone device. You can use the iPhone uh, simulator to simulate all the, the the iPhone devices available in the market and then test your application. And then the third one is the visual uh, code, which is from the Microsoft. You can use this for uh, developing either a, a web apps, or you can use uh, this one for developing uh, for the hybrid apps. Uh, so you can easily integrate uh, the uh, React Native framework or, uh, or the Flutter framework in the visual code and then develop and then debug the application. So the next one is the, the mobile application platform. So now if you develop the application and you push the application to the store, so how do you know that your application is performing good or not, right? So is there a way, like for example, somebody is using your app? How do you know that? Okay, how 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 many people are downloaded your app? How many people are really using your app? So uh, is there any crash happen? How do I know that crash happened in my app? So that's why what happened is there is a a, a platform Google came up with called a Firebase. So the Firebase is a, a mobile platform which uh, do a lot of things uh, it's free you can uh, use uh, pretty much all the functionality in your app so if you want to do a, a single sign on like for example you have a login screen and you want to do a facebook login or you want to do a, a google login uh, or uh, you want to do a, a phone authentication uh, you can use this firebase sdk and then you can access the a google uh, email like a google mail address and then you log in into your application. So uh, this also provide a storage. Uh, if you want to upload some logs, uh, like you collected a log on the uh, your mobile application, and then you want to upload it into uh, some location you want to upload, right? The Firebase will provide a, a storage for you, uh, and then you can upload uh, your log file there so that you can go and see if any issue happen in the the field. Like once you push it, it's it's not in your hand. So a uh, lot of users are using it. So if you want to collect some logging from them, you can use that. And then if you want to host your web uh, web apps, uh, they have a hosting functionality. And they also have a serverless functionality. Like uh, you can uh, run some kind of a, a serverless uh, functions to uh, uh, give some kind of a, a notification to your app. Uh, those you can do that. And then you can collect the data and do some machine learning with this Firebase. And then the uh, the quality side, they have a crashlytic, which is like your app crashes. Uh, if somebody is using your app and then it crashes, how do you know that? So this crashlytic will help you. And uh, the crash immediately, if you integrated the crashlytic SDK in your app, if any crash happens, it will uh, report to the Firebase you can go and it will also collect the stack trace of your crash so that you can see where exactly it happened and then uh, which function is uh, the crash happened. So in the next version, you can easily go and fix that issue and then push it into the app store again. The performance, like, okay, uh, how your application is performing. So uh, there is an SDK if you integrate it in your app, you can uh, check that how uh, the each, uh, uh, like if the user press on some button, how much time it is taking to render that functionality. So you can do the app performance, you can take a measurement and then you can improve where exactly the issue is there, like a uh, slow performing functions. Those are all you can still do with that. Term. And the next one is once you develop the application, you don't uh, have all the devices, right? You may have only one device. And then, but you want to test it, this one on various devices. So Firebase have a test lab, uh, which has a, a, they provide all kind of devices. 
and then you can just uh, uh, use uh, test your uh, application on the devices and then uh, and get the results from them like how it perform on the android 7 how it perform your application on android 8 android 9 and like that and then same thing with the ios 4 uh, 5 6 7 all kind of devices and then you'll get a report so this is not free the test lab one so is uh, paper use like if you are uh, using it then you need to pay for them so and then if you want to distribute your app to your local team like uh, for example you have an internal qa team how do you distribute this app because the pushing to the app store is for the public right it's not for the uh, the internal qa team so firebase has a app distribution where you can push your app and the uh, for testing the qa team is going to uh, download that app on their phone and then they will verify it and then they will uh, tell you uh, all the the uh, issues or any bugs or anything are there uh, they can file it so next one is the analytics so the firebase also has an analytics like okay you develop an app you push it to the store so but i think uh, there are some people they downloaded they come uh, they downloaded your app but they are not using it some people they are uh, downloaded and then they are uh, they sign up, but they are not using it. How do you know all of them? So there is a Firebase has a, a SDK, uh, uh, the analytics SDK called Firebase uh, Analytics. If you integrated that, and then yeah, that SDK will tell an events uh, uh, send into the your project. Like you go and create one project on Firebase, and then uh, that uh, any uh, anything like if somebody first time they uh, downloaded your app the event will come with the details of your uh, the device which uh, the 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 application install uh, if uh, somebody is installed on ios uh, 7 device and which is the operating system all kind of uh, information they collect and then send it uh, this way you know that okay somebody is first time they downloaded it but i think there is nothing happened uh, and then uh, somebody downloaded it and then they launch your app but they didn't sign up then somebody downloaded and launch and then sign up but they are not using the functionality so you know and then you also like okay somebody is downloaded and they sign up but they are not doing it they can you can push some uh discounts to them uh if you or if you, your app is doing some kind of functionality where you say like okay they are not buying anything so then you can say oh there is a discount you can push it to them by seeing all these analytics you can generate a report uh you can uh uh, see like how many users are downloading your app and what is their um, usage how many uh, that those kind of reports you can like uh, analytics you can do with this one and then uh, uh, you can also by getting this data you can predict also the predictions you can do and um, uh, a b testing is another uh, cool feature uh, you have a version one application is pushed into the market and then you want to uh, you are coming with the new ui which you don't want to push it to all the users you want to just push it to only a few of the users and then this is like okay a is my uh, version one b is my version uh, two uh, i don't want to do it for all the users you have uh, some selected uh, users you want to push that new user interface to them and then you will get a feedback from them if everything looks okay then you can do that so that's why it's a A-B testing is another is very important for the mobile app when uh, I'm moving from one uh, uh, UI to the other UI. The next you have a cloud messaging. Uh, uh, you can do a push notification to the users, like uh, you can send it uh, as you get uh, the details of the user and then you wanna push it to, uh, uh, to the users, you can use the cloud messaging functionality. And then uh, you can also do a in-app messaging uh, is as another feature like you want to uh, give some kind of a in, inside the app like cloud messaging is like you can push uh, some uh, messages to the sms uh, some other notifications some other apps also can get this messaging but in app is inside your app you want to push some notification you can use that functionality and the another cool feature is the remote config uh, instead of configuring everything uh, like uh, 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 in your app uh, you can uh, configure uh, your uh, some backend URLs. You can configure your uh, access keys and all of them in the remote config. 
so that your app doesn't have any uh, information. Uh, it's easy for you also to change the URLs, right? For, for example, you want to change it. If your app, you hard-coded in your app, it's very difficult. Uh, by using the remote config, you can uh, uh, change it. If, if your server is down, you want to do it in a different server, you can just go and uh, configure in the remote config. Your app is going to fetch that new URL and then start working. In it. So the next one is the dynamic links. So the mobile apps uh, have like a five or six screens you develop, but user don't want to go all the screens. And then how do you send it to the one specific screen? Like, okay, I want to take him to a, 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 a get code screen. or I want to send him to some, uh, a screen only from like a fifth screen from my application. So there is a functionality called deep linking. So uh, you, uh, you just create a, a URL and then you create a QR code and then um, you publish to that uh, your website. If a user wants to uh, like uh, uh, go, for example, somebody wants to buy a movie ticket and then you wanna buy uh, some specific movie, uh, he don't need to go and browse all the movies in that theater. So you create a QR code and then for that specific movie, so he'll just go and uh, scan that QR code and then it will directly taking him uh, to that particular uh, screen where that uh, specific movie related information is there. So it's called the deep linking. Uh, if uh, this deep linking is uh, dynamic linkings are uh, uh, is better than the deep linking. The deep linking is you need to install the app and then only that functionality will work. The dynamic link is you scan the QR code. If there is no app is there and uh, it will take you to the app store first and then you download the app and then you uh, if you want to subscribe it like if you want you once you do the subscription then also it doesn't uh, forget what exactly the action he needs to do so it will take you to that screen even if you don't have the uh, the app also like it will still remember where you have to take it to him so that's the the beauty of the dynamic links so ad maps is you want to push some ads you can do it so this is very good uh, uh, mobile application platform. You can achieve pretty much all the functionality uh, with this mobile application platform. So most of the companies are using this uh, uh, because uh, once you push it, uh, you wanna know the crash, you wanna know the user behavior, you wanna uh, uh, predict what is happening, you want to change the configuration, you wanna do the QR codes, now uh, you can do with this mobile application platform. The next one is the how you are going to push. Like you, once you develop the app, you need to push it to the store. So for the Apple one, they have a called App Store. For the Google, they have the Google Play Store. So once you develop the app, uh, uh, you need to push it to the app. So for that, you need a, a developer account. Uh, once you have the developer account, you log in into that. There is a, uh, a console. I go into that and then you upload your uh, IPA. The extension of the iOS application is the .ipa file. You upload it and then you fill the required information. So you need to provide your website, you need to give a privacy, all kind of information they ask. You have to provide a, a, a access to your uh, uh, application. They will go through the each and every screen of your application. And then uh, you have to provide all the icons you used it. Uh, the screenshot your app, uh, those are all you need to provide to the, the app store. So once the Apple will go and review it and they will check like, is there any content which is not as per their uh, norms, uh, they will reject your application. So if everything looks okay, then you can just go and push the app to the store. Once you push it within uh, uh, 24 hours, uh, your app is going to be available in the app store. Uh, but I think the review process in App Store is uh, is not uh, faster because they, they take time. It will take like uh, three days to five days time uh, to push it into that. Whereas in the Google Play Store, uh, process is same. You have to fill the information. You have to describe your application. You have to upload the screenshots. You have to provide your uh, URL. You have to provide your privacy, all those details to them. And they will review it, but you can, uh, but I think their review is uh, is not that uh, harder than the, the Apple review. And once it is available, 
you can control also like uh, you don't need to push it 100 percent to the store you can just uh, push it 10 percent first and then see how it is uh, behaving and then if a lot of complaint comes they can you can stop your uh, uh, deployment if it is okay then you can go on the deploy to next 50 percent 100 percent you can do that rollover is you can do so the the trends right now uh, in 2020 like a mobile app de application development uh, i think uh, augmented reality virtual reality uh, i think you can you already maybe seen that in the gaming application but they are adding a more use cases uh, that and then the the smart things which is like an internet of things uh, like a smart home like a turning on your lights or uh, turning on your thermostats or, uh, or opening your door, everything, yeah. So you can do it from your uh, phone uh, with the more use cases. And A and uh, machine learning uh, functionalities uh, uh, is adding in most of the the, uh, the mobile applications with the more, uh, more use cases. The beacons is the another one. Uh, they are using it, uh, uh, identifying the, the uh, the location right for example you are going in the airport and then there is a starbucks is there so and if the starbucks has a beacon there and then uh, you are using the starbucks app uh, they both will talk and then tell you like oh exactly oh this location is there so to finding easily with that uh, the beacons are people are using a lot and then the cloud uh, uh, applications mobile application and the mobile wallets also like uh, google pay apple pay um, Samsung Pay, like uh, all other banks, uh, you can do a transaction from your mobile phone. And then there is a blockchain application, there is a wearable, and then there is an on-demand development app. So these are all like, yeah, uh, there is a lot of uh, attraction for the mobile application. It's, it's a growing. Uh, you can do anything because the, the phones are like uh, very powerful now. They have a very good processors and you can do a, a, a process, uh, image processing, and all you can do it in the phone itself. So uh, in my uh, company, uh, we uh, capture the uh, uh, like a car license plate because my company is basically in the parking side. So we capture the license plate, we process it, we do the, the OCR, like object uh, recognition one, so, and then do it in the phone itself. We are not even calling the API kind of thing. So there are libraries are available. You can do it with the uh, latest phones. So these are the differences and further readings. So whatever I talked, uh, I put it here. Uh, if you want to do Android documentation, there is an URL I gave iOS documentation uh, for the hybrid. Uh, if you want to learn more about the React Native, I provided here and then the Flutter uh, dot programming documentation I gave, and then the, if you want to see the Flux architecture I provided here, and then the Firebase, if you want to learn about all this uh, mobile platform, uh, you can go and look for that. And uh, if you want to create an Apple developer account, uh, I provided the URL and then the Google developer account. So thank you. Any questions? Now I can take. Any questions, if you guys have, I think, yeah, I can answer you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. thanks. We love the first time. Thank you, Madam Mercer. Uh, uh, Mr. Kaleem Mohammed has completed his presentation, so we are waiting for any questions from the audience uh, that uh, you can take now. Over to you. Let's give a minute or two, Kalim, for them to. Sure, sure. 
there is a lot to cover in the mobile side but i think yeah i put it uh, maybe as too much of uh, documentation i think yeah so firebase is uh, firebase itself is going to take uh, a, a complete day <laughs> because they have a, a lot of things in that one i think kalim you did very well i think i saw a lot of the comments that are coming in the in the facebook uh, overall uh, audience like the session i think your presentation was um, clear and, and precise and very useful for for today's um, mobile industry so yeah thank you thank you for for presenting I think we have some questions coming up uh, on the screen, uh, Kaleem. Maybe um, uh, Srikesh is asking, what is the minimum requirement for PC to develop an Android app like Android Studio? What are other alternatives? Anything you could comment on that, uh, Kaleem? So I think, yeah, so it's the minimum requirement, I think, yeah. So nowadays, all the PCs are coming up with the the good ARM process, uh, the Intel processors, which have the there is nothing specific like oh you need to have this processor like uh, uh, Intel 7 only Intel uh, not like that so it will work uh, only thing is you will have a little bit uh, slow performance using the Android Studio uh, but I think yeah so any Windows PC uh, with the the good RAM uh, I don't know like uh, maybe one GB all this new. Uh, PCs are coming with the one two GB or uh, is also enough. Yeah, I'm not sure. Thank you, Kalim. Can we go to the next question, please? Kalim, are you able to see the question from Indra Paul? Yeah. We can download the free app from Google. Yeah, please comment on that. So from the Google Play Store, uh, yeah, or the uh, which one is that? This one is the download the free app from there. Yeah. So once you develop the app, I'm, I didn't understand like clearly, but I think yeah, uh, if once you develop the app, there are two ways, right? One is you are, you want to monetize your app, or you want to just uh, uh, give it for free, right? So free is uh, they don't uh, uh, like you can just develop and push it. And then people can download it from the the Google Play Store and the Apple Play Store, and then the SDKs uh, uh, to download uh, for the Android Studio is all free. You just go to the uh, browser like a Google page and then uh, download Android uh, Studio. Uh, then you can uh, pretty much download the the Studio, which is free. You can start building from right away, so there is no uh, uh, money involved in it. If if I understand the question correctly. Uh, this is another interesting question from from the audience can you explain the beacon yeah, i was also fascinated by uh, your comment on the on the beacon um, uh, side um, uh, okay. yeah better i, uh, I want to show you guys the beacon how it looks like yeah, yeah, well, like demo half. okay that's that's fantastic yeah please go so this is the the beacon it looks like this can you guys see uh, so it's a Bluetooth, uh, low energy Bluetooth uh, device, uh, like uh, devices these are. So you can put it uh, 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 to like a location, right? For example, uh, one example I can give you. So they have a, a smaller ones also. So these ones. So I am using this one for the ST mode. Uh, they are the, the good ones. And uh, all these iOS and the Android, they have a, a very good uh, Bluetooth uh, SDKs. So you can uh, access their library, and then you can talk to the blue, low, low energy Bluetooth one. One of the example is like uh, uh, you have a parking lots with the, the garage, uh, with the gated, gated parking lots. So uh, now the COVID-19, uh, people, they don't want to touch any buttons or anything. So they just want to come. And they want to go because they already purchased your parking and then they want to enter into that. So how they are going to do. So you have a mobile app and then they put the beacon uh, to the gate and it will communicate and then it will uh, get the details uh, from that beacon. And then the beacon, like if the, the garage has a three gates and then you keep a three gate, three beacons there. So first one is like uh, you get the details and your app will look into that. 
uh, the UUID, basically you interacted with the beacon, it has a unique identifier. And then uh, you pass it to the backend and then backend will say like, oh, this is a, a valid user and uh, it will tell like, okay, open the gate. So you don't need to press the button and then go. So that's the one use case for the beacon. The second use cases is like uh, uh, airports, right? In the airports, you have uh, so many shops and then you don't know where exactly that one. So uh, now the mobile apps are developing, like for example, Starbucks has a, an app and then you want to find the uh, the Starbucks in the airport, which gate and where exactly. So when you are walking it, and then sometimes you miss also, right? They are putting the beacon there in their entrance. And then when you are walking with the Starbucks app, and then it identifies, oh, there is a Starbucks because it communicate with that low energy Bluetooth communication within the 100 meters range. And then uh, uh, it will communicate and immediately pop up that, okay, there is a Starbucks next to your left so that you can go. So the beacons is getting very uh, popular nowadays. So they are using it, uh, uh, this one. I guess the same can be used in a large shopping mall to identify. Exactly, yeah. Maps. So you don't need to go to the, uh, the, the, every time we go to the gate and look for the map, where is this one? And then walk the whole mall exactly. so with this beacon. And then, yeah, you have that particular application like Uni, uh, Uniflow or whatever. So you just uh, launch their app and then uh, when you are walking it, if it is uh, connected to that blue, uh, like a beacon, and then it will tell you, oh, this app shop is here only. So those are the use cases for the beacon. Great. Yeah, I send the, I have the dot materials uh, in my references. If it is not there, I'll send it. Uh, I think, yeah, you can just Google it and you will find it. Thanks, Kaleem. Thanks, question. Yes, so yeah, Android Studio is yeah very easy to develop mobile application. Yeah, so Android Studio is good. Eclipse is uh, no more support, uh, better not to use. Android Studio, uh, I think you get everything. Uh, even the compilation time, you can see like how long your code is taking. They have a very good uh, 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 the measurements and all. And then uh, it's, uh, uh, the simulators, I think emulators are integrated in that one you can debug the app. So with the Eclipse, you have to install all those plugins, which is uh, no more available now. They are not even supporting it. So, and then the Android Studio also like uh, uh, is mature now. It's like a 4.0.1 version. So it's very good. So you can use the Android Studio, yeah. So if you say I'm a native app guy, so is a native app is better because it's a performance wise and I play with a lot with the hardware and I want to always uh, uh, test the uh, the anything if uh, Apple release and I uh, like a Google release, I don't want to use somebody to develop a, a library. So I always recommend a native apps is better. But I think uh, the problem with the native app is uh, you need to develop two times, right? You have to write for the Android you have to write for the iOS, but if the hybrid app is like, uh, you don't have a less time, like uh, you don't need any hardware interaction, better to go with the hybrid app, so. So it depends on the on the, on the the use case and the, and, the, and the business conditions in which you want exactly. to develop the application. Patent right of which one? I think if you develop your application, which is, uh, it's nobody has it, I think, yes, you will get it. But I think I'm not sure exactly your question. No, no, it's all free, free only. Google and uh, even the, the Mac also, nowadays, if you see, uh, uh, the Apple also giving their operating system, everything is in free. So nobody is charging right now. So I think, yeah, so Android Studio, you can download and then use it, yeah. There is no cost involved. Until unless you don't uh, push it to the, even if it is, uh, you wanna push it to the store, it's not very expensive. And Google is pretty much giving, even the Firebase also, you can uh, uh, use pretty much all their functionality uh, free, only uh, two or three are, uh, is, uh, you need to pay per use only. It all depends on how much you are going to use. If you're not using it, it's not even cost. They have a different plans. Uh, they have a Blaze plan, which is like $90 something. 
uh, if you are not using that much this uh, that is also free there is i think nobody is uh, charging nowadays like before you can just go and download and start using it start developing it i think so yeah so it's all uh, smart stuff so definitely it will come into the edge computing only What does it mean, App Inventor, Krishna? I don't know. So uh, maybe they can explain more. Can, yeah, can you can you elaborate that one? We can go to the next question. Maybe Tanvir can, can explain more about that question. Thank you, sir. I thank Mr. Kalin, sir, for providing detailed information on mobile development, mobile app, native app, hybrid app, and the IDE involved to create the mobile app and the platform, Firebase information and analytics provider. It's very much useful session for all of us, for all of us sir. Thank you, sir. Now you. I invite, now I invite Mr. Krishna Kumar, sir, to share about IGL technologies. Thank you, madam. So maybe if you can, uh, I'll stop, I'll share a few slides uh, to briefly talk about uh, what we do at IGL. Uh, again, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Kaleem, for that wonderful session. Uh, I, along with Kaleem and the several other members, uh, the IGL hands-on is all about getting the college students ready for the next generation IT challenges so um so basically we are who are we we are based in us india and and, and dubai uh, we started our online project based training our philosophy is to uh, promote uh, um, hands-on based uh, projects in colleges uh, we started out in, in us students uh, two years ago uh, last year we expanded it to colleges in india uh, very proud to say that we have rrc college uh, that is hosting this um, uh, fdp webinar is one of them uh, we have other colleges as well in the area. In 2020, this year, our goal is to serve more colleges, and uh, but selected engineering and arts colleges. Uh, so our our philosophy is to work with college staff and students, and leverage all of these online video conferencing because of the uh, COVID situation we are in. We are planning to offer more and more online project-based uh, uh, training uh, seminars uh, for for students. So this is what we have been doing. And our mission statement is to train college students continuously. So, I mean, typically, if, if you take a look at a college student's uh, life, uh, they do the projects at the very end. Uh, whether it is if it is a three-year uh, curriculum, then they do it in the last semester. If it is an engineering college, they do it in, the, in their fourth year. Uh, but we believe that it's too late. Uh, so they could start doing many projects uh, from from very first semester itself because these days um, computer programming languages are getting taught uh, even in high schools so our idea is to start the techniques from the first year through the final year of the college teach advanced techniques i mean rather than uh, pro the, doing projects in the traditional uh, computer science uh, areas uh, we are trying to bring in uh, new areas like ai internet of things cloud computing chatbots and so on and leverage the open source when one of the things that um, kaleem talked about was a lot about open source software and right? i think uh, we want to bring in the awareness of open source software to college students at a very early age um, so they get used to those tools and software and then they can start doing projects using them and uh, we are also very happy to announce that we have company sponsored internships so any students who sign up with the igl hands on for for projects uh, we we tie up with companies in, in us and india so we can uh, we can offer you internships uh, for those students as well as some working remote working opportunities because of the situation we are in many companies in us uh, they are looking for uh, bright students uh, whether it is undergrad students or postgraduate students uh, to work remotely and and, and contribute um, so from second year onwards we are offering such uh, remote working opportunities uh, so the whole idea behind ideal hands-on is to significantly improve the employability of the students uh, for the for the final year student, but we want to see it's a holistic approach that we start from the very first year itself. 
So that's what our uh, mission is. So here is a typical uh, set of projects that we go through uh, in a three-year undergraduate students, uh, for example, a college like RRC. Uh, first year, we would do chatbot and progressive web app. I think uh, Kalim talked about web apps. A variation of that is progressive web app. Then second year onwards, we slowly bring in intermediate projects using MongoDB, voice over IP, IP Google Dialogflow, and things like that. And then third year, we bring in more uh, advanced technologies like Alexa, uh, cloud programming, and so on. So we have a nice um, uh, uh, catalog of projects uh, for first year students, second year students, and, and third year students. And uh, so we have been doing it uh, with, with many colleges now. Uh, so we are very, uh, very proud of that. And of course, uh, when you go to the four year, it's, it's very similar. Uh, we do a little bit more in the third year uh, for the, for the four year undergraduate um, students. Uh, so that's what we are all about and IGL hands on. So if you'd like to uh, reach us for any uh, projects that uh, your students would like to do, please uh, email us at uh, IGL hands on at uh, gmail.com. Um, so, so thank you, uh, RRC management and, and uh, principal sir and uh, Deepa madam, Ms. Rani madam, Ganesh Kumar sir and Charanya madam for giving us an opportunity to, to present about IGL hands on. Uh, like we mentioned yesterday, uh, we started this partnership uh, about two years ago, and we intend to continue more and more uh, advanced uh, projects in, in, uh, for students. Our whole idea is to uh, bring in the latest technology in the form of projects, uh, simple projects, mini projects that can be done in one month, two months. Uh, so our, our concept is by the time the student completes their final year, imagine if they have completed you know, 20 projects. Uh, definitely their their resume will look a will look lot better than one projects at the very end of their final year. So that's our mission. And we look to um, uh, support from uh, wonderful colleges like RRC uh, and, and, on, and more colleges as well. So with that, I'll, I'll stop sharing. And uh, again, I want to thank um, RRC management. Uh, back to you, Madam, for... Um, Thank you, sir. The presentation was nice. And we are very happy to work with you. And I think we have one more question. Yes, uh, there are uh, nominal charges for the IGL hands on projects. Uh, please send us an email to IGL hands on at email.com. Uh, we will share with you those charges. Any other questions uh, for, for the ideal hands on team? No, sir. Thank you, everyone, once again. Now I welcome Ms. S. Pandishwari, Assistant Professor, PG Department of Computer Science, to deliver a vote of thanks. I am honored and happy to have the opportunity to give a vote of thanks today. Mr. Kalim Mohammed's speech was extraordinary. The way he mentioned the need for digital education. I would like to thank all of these trustees, principal organizing team, and all other faculties for being a part of this program and making this event a success. Thank you all. Madam, at this time, uh, we would also like to thank uh, ITL Hands-On team, uh, Mr. Rajesh Kumar sir and uh, Mr. Govind sir, who is also participating in this, in this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you from, from, from our side as well. Thank you, sir. And to all the participants, feedback link has been shared. So kindly fill the feedback and join to tomorrow's session, Shafi Atali. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.